Hello everyone, my name is Reed, welcome to Lab 9. So this week we will be learning about comparing two independent means testing. Um, so taking a look again at our weekly schedule for our new online type course. So in general, um, on Fridays, we sh should be when we release all of our information for the following week for you guys to look over. So that'll be all the recordings. So we have our lecture recordings as well as this lab video recording released by 8 a.m. Remember that you guys should be watching the lectures before the lab as the lab is meant to be a review of lecture material. So make sure that you guys are watching lectures first. Um, and then on Mondays is usually when we'll have our pre-labs due via Canvas assignments by 8 a.m. Tuesdays and Wednesdays is when we'll be hosting our virtual live stream labs via BlueJeans. So make sure you check out the link for the schedule for that and you can go to the one that works best for you. Even if you are watching this recording as your way of going to lab, the virtual live streams are still helpful for you guys to get any questions answered if you aren't entirely sure about what's happening in the lab. Those are still helpful to go to as well. And then also on Fridays is, um, for the most part, when we'll try to have our due dates for most of our stuff. So um, homework via coursework should be end up being due by 8 a.m. as well as um, our lab wrap-up quizzes, which is how you get your lab attendance. So those quizzes um, should also, for the most part, be due by 8 a.m. Um, and also our MWrite Prompt 2 is still running, um, so in addition to these weekly tasks. So a little bit more specific to what we're talking about this particular week, what needs to get done. Um, so remember to check Canvas for official due dates and times, as this is kind of a weird time right now. So there might be some changes um, to these particular dates. So just make sure you keep up on Canvas as to when these due dates actually are. So for this week, um, remember what we need to do is to complete the Lab 9 wrap-up quiz. So once you do finish up the lab for this week, take that lab wrap-up quiz, make sure you get at least a 75% on that quiz, and you'll get your attendance credit. And also remember the wrap-up quiz is basically what it is. It's just pulling questions from the review by example, the ILP and lab project, as well as the lab ticket. So just a randomization of all those questions. Um, you need to um, answer those questions, make sure you get at least 75%, and you'll be good. Um, also, we need to complete homework eight for this week, as well as finish up our tail end of our final, or our prompt two, our final revision will be due sometime this week, as well as the beginning of next week, we'll have our um, next pre-lab due. Um, and also a little bit about the second exam, as you guys have been wondering about. Um, so exam two will end up being administered remotely on Thursday, April 2nd, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. There should be more details on this coming soon, but just for now, this is all the information we have. So some helpful study material for exam two. Um, if you guys want to check out uh, supplement one, as well as worksheets one and two, so all of these are within your lab workbook. So if you go to your lab workbook before the labs actually start, we have these things called supplements and worksheets. Those are real helpful to look at. Those go over all the interpretations that we've gone over so far, as well as all the assumptions for each of our different tests that we've run. So those are real helpful tool to look at. Um, name that scenario is also real helpful. There should be a link from the Canvas homepage. Um, so this is really helpful when, like, given a certain prompt, can you tell me what type of test this is? So if it's like a one proportion, two proportion, one mean, paired mean, two means, all these different types of tests. So name that scenario is really helpful with given a prompt, what type of test do I need to run? Um, problem roulette, these go over old exam questions. So that's also really helpful. Make sure that if you do problem roulette to specifically click on topics five through nine as those will be relevant for the exam too. And as well, you can always look at the homeworks both recommended and required. So homeworks four through eight are relevant to this exam. Uh, and also for this exam, as you've seen, we've gone over a lot more interpretations and definitions so far. So all these um, lists of definitions. So can we interpret all these terms for all of our five statistical scenarios? Um, so again, those one thing that would be helpful in looking at these interpretations would be those worksheets, as we talked about. I think um, supplement 
one of the supplements goes over in general the these interpretations in terms of a proportion type test, and then one of the worksheets is a similar thing where you have to write them out in terms of a one mean type test. So those are helpful not only in learning those interpretations, but how to take them from one type of test to another. So that'll be real helpful in terms of learning about these interpretations. So let's start off with a little bit of review. So with last week's lab, we were talking about paired data analysis. So in which case paired data, we would be concerning ourselves with um, two particular observations, one from one group, one from another. We would pair them by those particular observations and find the differences between them. So in ways that data could end up being matched or paired, remember we had our two different ways. First way was with same individual. And in, each, in which case, um, each unit is has two different measurements, and we were concerned with the differences between those two measurements of that same individual. Um, another way is instead of the same individual, instead we have similar individuals or units in a pair, and each particular member of the pair ends up getting a different treatment. And again, what we're concerning ourselves with is the difference between those outcomes of the treatment. So that was with paired data analysis. So now with this week with our independent data, so what if our data is not matched or paired? And instead, um, we just have two independent groups and we want to analyze the difference between these means. So in this case, we can run a two sample t-test. So two independent samples, instead of pairing particular observations, finding those differences between these observations, and then finding the average, the mean of those differences. Instead, this week with our two independent samples, our two independent populations, what we are instead doing is first, we're finding the averages of those two particular groups separately, and then, and then finding the difference between those means. So ways that um, our independent data could look like, um, so we could have samples taken from two different populations. So say, for example, we were looking at differences between average differences between Michigan versus Michigan State students, or looking at average differences between English majors and math majors. So we could have two different populations and be looking at the um, mean differences between those. Another way our independent data could look is if we do have one particular random sample, but then we end up with categorizing them two different ways. So say an example of that, we have our one particular sample of US citizens, and then we decide to categorize them as old versus young. So we have our one sample, and then we're breaking them off into two different independent groups. Same thing, another example, if we have our one group of Ann Arbor residents, and we end up separating them men versus women. So again, our one sample, and then we end up with our two independent groups from it. Um, so let's go ahead and see a couple examples and see if we can figure out if we're working with paired or independent in samples. So think about it. Um, when we're going through these questions, feel free to pause the video to think about it yourself before we go over the solutions. So for this first question, the Ann Arbor Public Library has data for all of their cardholders. They wish to examine whether late fees differ for young adults and senior citizens on average. They randomly select 50 young adults and 50 senior citizens from their database for this analysis. So do you think this is an example of paired data or independent samples? So we would say this would be an example of independent samples. So you see we have our two samples of 50 young adults and 50 senior citizens, but you also see that there's nothing in particular that's pairing one particular observation to another. There's nothing pairing one young adult to one senior citizen and finding the difference in these two particular observations. Instead, we're just on average finding the difference between these two groups, so independent sample. Next question. A small local business ships out packages regularly to its customers. They want to see which shipping option, FedEx or UPS, would be cheaper to use on average. For their next 30 packages, they get a shipping cost estimate from both delivery companies. So again, do you think this is an example of paired data or independent samples? So in this case, we'd say it's an example of paired data. 
um, you see that each particular package are out of our 30 packages, each of them has two different shipping costs, two different measurements. So we would end up pairing those measurements by the package and then finding the differences between those measurements. So how about for this question? We have a STATS 250 student wants to estimate how many additional points Michigan students earn on their SAT exam than MSU students on average. So again, paired data or independent samples. So this is an example of independent samples. Again, we have our two different groups, Michigan and MSU students, but we're not, um, there's nothing actually pairing these SAT scores from one observation, one Michigan student to one MSU student. So now we're just looking at independent samples. So let's go ahead and get started on the review by example. It will be on page 69 of your lab workbooks. Go ahead and go over the prompt. Um, so according to a recent study by the Pew Research Center, on average, there is a large earnings gap between young adults with a bachelor's degree or higher, which we'll call group one, and those without a bachelor's degree, which we'll call group two, despite soaring student debt. The study reports that in 2014, young adults with only a high school diploma earned 62% of what the typical college graduate earns. To assess this finding, a random sample of young adults was taken and the annual gross salary in thousands of dollars was recorded along with the highest degree earned. So although this is a different type of hypothesis test, it is still a hypothesis test, so we have our four steps we need to follow. The first um, is determining the null and alternative hypotheses, which we'll go over right now. So again, we have three different possible options for our hypothesis statements. Um, usually the for our null hypothesis, what we're testing for is if there is a difference between the means or not. So our null hypothesis would be that there is no difference. So mu1 minus mu2 just equals zero. And then our alternative hypothesis, what we're actually trying to test for, would be see if it's greater than zero, less than zero, or just simply unequal to zero. And that's specifically if we're seeing if there is a difference or not. So again, we can say our mu1 minus mu2 represents that difference in population means. So mu1 is the mean for group 1, and mu2 is the mean for group 2. Um, so when we're looking at these hypotheses, this format is also acceptable. So when we write out that null hypothesis, mu1 minus mu2 equals 0, um, it's the same thing as just writing mu1 equals mu2. So now we can move on to the question in the review by example for our second step. So it says, clearly state the assumption necessary to perform a pooled hypothesis test. So before we go on to this specific assumption, we can go ahead and take a look at what all of our assumptions are for our independent means test. Um, so we can go ahead and look at last week's testing for one mean and paired mean and see what our assumptions are for those. Um, so we had, remember these two assumptions, our first is that our data are a random sample, and the second, our data are observations from a normally distributed population. So this week, concerning with independent means testing, a couple of the assumptions are pretty similar, but there might be a few extras as well that are a little different. So let's take a look at those. Uh, so our first couple assumptions, again, we can say each sample of data can be considered a random sample, and each set of data comes from a normally distributed population. So again, those are pretty similar to what we know already. Um, the only difference is that since we're looking at two independent means from two independent groups, we have to make those assumptions based on all of those groups. In this case, both two groups. Um, so those are the first two assumptions that are familiar to us. And then we are also add on a couple others. Um, so the third assumption is that these two samples are independent from one another. Since we're dealing with two independent means, we need to make sure that those groups that we're working with are in fact independent. And then our fourth and final assumption is that the population variances are equal. And we need this to hold if we want to specifically perform a pooled hypothesis test. Um, okay, and looking back at the second assumption for normality, remember how we would normally check for this normal assumption that we would plot either a QQ plot or histogram. In this case, since we're working with multiple groups, that means we need to plot multiple QQ plots or histograms to check for this, one for each of the 
samples that we're working with. Um, so going back to our original question about the assumption necessary for a pooled test, um, it's specifically our last assumption that those population variances are equal for the two groups. We can also write them out in our notation, our sigma squared 1 equals sigma squared 2. Um, so a little bit more about pooled. Um, so for our pooled test, again, we need that assumption that those population variances are equal. Um, if this does not hold, then it doesn't mean that we can't move forward, though. That just means we have to run a different type of test. So instead of like a pooled test, we have to run instead something that is called general or unpooled or Welch's test. So if our original test is pooled, it would be easier just to think about it as unpooled, pooled or unpooled. Um, and so that just assumes that our population variances are not equal. So now that we know the different types of independent means tests that we can run and our assumption for our equal variances, so how are we supposed to check for that assumption? Well, there are a few different ways that we can check. So for this equal variance assumption, the first way we can check is to compare the sample standard deviations, so standard deviations for each of our samples. And we want to see if those are similar to one another. And in this case, whenever I, I mention the word similar, in this case similar means that the larger one is no more than twice the smaller one. So in this case, if we were, so like say for example, if we had two groups with two different sample standard deviations, one had a standard deviation of two and one had a standard deviation of three. In this case, the larger one is three is not twice, it's not more than twice as much as two is. So in that case, we could define them as similar. So that's our first way um, of checking for this, that the sample standard deviations are similar. The second way is comparing side-by-side -side box plots. And we want to see if the length of the boxes, which is what our interquartile ranges are, we want to see those IQRs as well being similar. Again, similar meaning the larger one is not more than twice the smaller. There's also a third way that we can check for this equal variance assumption is to perform Levine's test, which is basically running another formal hypothesis test to assess if the population variances can be assumed equal. So these are three different ways. Um, whenever you're running through one of these tests, you really only have to do one of them, but it's good to know how to work through all three of them. So specifically talking about that Levine's test, um, again, this is a specific hypothesis test to assess if the population variances can be assumed equal. So whenever we run Levine's test, it's always run the same way with our null hypothesis being that those population variances are equal, and our alternative is just simply that they are not equal. Then um, we will always use a 10% significance level for Levine's test, so the significance level never changes. It's always at 10%. So since our significance level is at 10%, whenever we run through Levine's test and get a p-value, again, it's the same way. We just have to compare that p-value to our significance level of 0.1 or 10%. And if it's less than or equal to 10, in that case, remember, we reject the null. And if we reject the null, the null being that the variances are equal, that means if we end up rejecting the null, that means it's unreasonable to assume equal variance, and we should use the unpooled approach. And our independent test. Um, but if we have a p-value greater than 10%, that means that we fail to reject the null of equal variances. That means that it is reasonable to assume that those variances are equal and we can use our pooled approach for this test. All right. So now that we know a little bit about Levine's test, um, let's look at this particular example where we have an output for Levine's test. Um, we have a certain value and our um, probability, our p-value associated. So given this, which approach will be used for this two-sample t-test? So in this case, if we're looking at our p-value within this output, we see it's 0.13. Um, remember, our significance level for Levine's test is always 10% or 0.1. So in this case, our 13% is larger than 0.1. That means that we would fail to reject our null hypothesis of Levine's test, in which case the assumption of equal variances is reasonable. And we can go ahead and use that pooled approach. So that was just a separate example. 
Now we can look back at this particular review by example problem based on the R output provided and R box plot. Which t-test results will we report? So do you think we should use a pooled or unpooled approach for our particular problem? So in this case, we would also still want to use a pooled approach, um, but let's list the three reasons that support this decision. So our first reason, um, first we can look at those standard deviations. So if we see within our output, we have our standard deviations for both of our groups. We see that they are 2.08 and 1.93. Since the larger one is not more than twice the smaller one in this case, we can go ahead and say that these are similar to one another. The second reason, we can um, look at those IQRs, the length of the IQRs within this output as well. For our first group, it's 2.244, and for our second group, it's 1.869. Again, since the larger one is not, twice as, is not more than twice as the other one, we can say that these are similar. And then our third reason, if we see the output for Levine's test as well, we could see the p-value for Levine's test was 0.885, which again is greater than 10%. So at this point, with our Levine's test, we fail to reject that null hypothesis, and in which case we can assume that pooled approach. All right, so that about wraps it up for the review by example. So we can go ahead and get started with the ILP. So the prompt for this is that, is there a significant difference be between the population mean SSHA scores for females and males for all freshmen at Southwestern College? So you can go ahead and pause the video to work on this for however long you need. And then after you're done, you can go ahead and click, um, click play, and we'll go over a few select solutions before we move on with the rest of the lab. Um, so this lab will be using the R data, SSHA.R data, which remember all of our data sets can be found in the data sets folder on Canvas. Go ahead and get started, pause the video, and when you're done, move on with the rest of the lab. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the harder questions for this ILP. Um, so for this question, towards the tail end, we want to provide an, an interpretation of the p-value within the context of the problem. So this is one example of how we could write this p-value interpretation. We could say, assuming there is no difference between the population mean SSHA scores for females and males for all freshmen at Southwestern College, the probability of observing a t-test statistic of 2.0324 or greater or observing a t-test statistic of negative 2.0324 or less is 4.95%. So the first part, you might have seen that this is taken directly from the problem. So remember within our p-value interpretation, first we have to write out assuming the null hypothesis is true. In this case, this is where we can add in our context of the problem, what the null hypothesis is, there, that there is no difference between the population mean SSHA scores between females and males for all freshmen. And then also later on within the interpretation, so the probability of observing a t-test statistic of positive 2.03 or greater, or a t-test statistic of negative 2.03 or less. So it's good to be specific since we're working with a two-sided test. So whenever we find that p-value that means we're working with that two-tailed test, so we plot both the positive and the negative points of our test statistic and shade more extreme to either side. So it's good to describe in detail what we're actually doing there. So positive 2.03 or greater, or negative 2.03 or less, both tails for that p-value. And that both of those added up gets us our full p-value of 4.95%. Now I can look at another question. What is your conclusion within the context of the problem? So there are multiple ways that we can write out our conclusions. One way we could say there is sufficient support to suggest that the population mean SSHA scores for females and males for all freshmen at Southwestern College is significantly different. Or another way we could write it, there is sufficient support to suggest that the difference between the population mean SSHA scores for females and males for all freshmen at Southwestern College is different than zero. So in both cases, we're just writing out like if there is or is not sufficient support for the alternative hypothesis. 
So whenever we write out our conclusions, we're basically writing, there is or is not sufficient support to suggest that the alternative hypothesis is true. So that latter part, the alternative is true, we just have to write that out within our context of the problem. So in this case, our alternative, since we're doing a two-sided test, our alternative if, would be that the means are just simply unequal to each other or that their difference is not equal to zero. Now before we move on to the lab ticket, I want to again go over a term of the week. So this week we'll be talking about the standard error. So the generic standard error interpretation we could say is that it is an estimate of the approximate average distance of a set of observations from their mean. So you might, you might see that this interpretation is actually pretty similar to one we know before, the standard deviation. So one thing to remember is that the standard error is basically just an estimate of our standard deviation. So as we said, the standard error is very similar, um, but as you see um, within the formulae for each standard error and standard deviation, that since the standard error is an estimate, that means that whenever we find it, that we're using our sample data. So you can see within these formulae for the standard error for our one population proportion, we can see that we're using our one sample proportion p hat. Right next door, if we're working with the standard error of our two population proportion, we can see that we have our sample proportions for our two groups, p1 and p2. So p hat 1, p hat 2, those two sample proportions as well as the finding the standard error within our mean test, we have to use that sample standard deviation, that lowercase s. So the standard error, since it's an estimate, we're using that sample data to find it. That's why within our interpretation, we have to include the idea that the value is an estimate. So that keyword estimate is kind of one of the bigger deals within the interpretation. Um, so just a little note. Um, as you see that the standard error and standard deviation are pretty similar, it might be a little hard to differentiate between the two. So pages 84 and 123 in your lecture notes have really good comparisons between these two. So it's really good um, in learning the differences between them. Those particular pages in the lecture notes will be good to go over. Um, so let's think back again to the last, the previous week's term of the week when we were talking about the, the example with the basketball that your friend claims to make 80% of his free throws. So let's say, again, that you run the test and your friend makes 74 out of 100 free throws. That will give us a sample proportion of 74%, or 0.74. So doing this, um, so knowing only the sample proportion, we would not be able to calculate that standard deviation. So remember, within the standard deviation, we need to know that information about our population. So we need that population proportion, p, to find that standard deviation. So instead of that, we could use our standard error as a way to estimate that deviation. So you see our standard error is the same formula, except we're replacing that population proportion with our sample proportion, p hat. So to find that standard error, we can plug in that sample proportion of 0.74, as well as our, si our sample size of 100. And within that formula, we should get our standard error of 0.0439. So now that we know what the standard error is, um, we can go ahead and see what it actually means within this problem. So one way that we could interpret this value, we could say something like we would estimate the average distance of the possible sample proportions of three for those made by your friend from all possible random samples of 100 from the true population proportion for all free throws made by your friend to be roughly 0.0439. So again, looking at these keywords within this interpretation, remember that big keyword estimate, since our standard error is just an estimate of these distances. So we say that we would estimate the average distance from our sample to our mean. So in this case, when we're talking about our possible sample proportions, we could obtain the average distance from all of those to our true population proportion. We're saying that average distance is roughly 0 0.0439. All right. So that about does it with the term of the week. Um, so remembering the necessities for this interpretation, our first thing, that big keyword estimate, remember the standard error is an estimate of our standard deviation. 
and as such we can also throw in those keywords that we know already before that the idea that this is an average distance as well as looking at what particular observations that we're looking at so in this case our observations were any possible sample proportions we could get so in this particular case our sample proportion was 0.74 so let's say your friend did like another 100 free throws and got a different sample proportion of like 68 out of 100. Then he did another sample, another 100 free throws and got a different sample proportion. So this 0.74 is just one observation out of all of our possible sample proportions. And we're saying that the standard error is the average of all of those possible samples to our mean or true population proportion. So other than that, we just also need to note that we're working with this approximate average distance and as well as all of our interpretations we need to add in that context of the problem. All right so the last thing that we should work on for the lab today is the lab ticket. Um, so if you, um, go ahead and pause the video and just work on the ticket. We'll go over um, some selected solutions after. Um, so for this ticket um, we have the prompt, a sample of 29 wines from a large distributor has been randomly selected from a wine tasting event. Three responses are commonly measured, each on a quantitative scale, are aroma, flavor, and quality. The 29 wines were also classified by the region where each was produced. So we are asked to provide a 95% confidence interval estimate for the difference in the population mean flavor rating for the two regions. So we have this output already provided to us where we got our mean standard deviation and sample size for each of the reasons, each of the regions, as well as the Levine's test to see if we were able to run our pooled or unpooled test as well as running our actual t-test. So with all this output we can go ahead and answer the following questions. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at one of the questions for this. So specifically, the second question well, it might have been a little tricky, so let's go ahead and think about it. Um, which of the following values must be the pooled estimate of the common population standard deviation? So for the common population standard deviation, if we look at, at the, the variable, this S sub P, um, so remember that lowercase s is how we denote that sample standard deviation, and when it has that p subscript, it's just saying that it's our, our common, our pooled standard deviation. So in this particular case, if we look at our two standard deviations with each of our groups, we had our, for region 1, our standard deviation was 0.88, and then our standard deviation for region 2 was 0.915. So Remembering this, that um, this pooled, this common population standard deviation is pretty similar to how we estimated that common population proportion in chapter 6. So knowing that the pooled estimate for the common population standard deviation is a weighted average of the individual sample standard deviations. So we do know that this should fall somewhere in between the two standard deviations, the two groups. And it also should be in favor of the sample standard deviation with the larger sample size. So in this particular case, our sample size of region 1 was a little bigger than region 2. So that means that when we find that common standard deviation, it should be a little closer to region 1's standard deviation than region 2's. So that's why, that's why our answer of 0.894, it's somewhere in between our two standard deviations and it does favor the first one. So that's how we came up with that. Alright, so that about wraps it up for this Lab 9. If you have any questions regarding this material, feel free to reach out to your lab instructor with any questions or ask during office hours or also go to the virtual lab live streams and you can ask during then as well. Um, remember for the rest of the work they have to work on this week, um, check Canvas for those official due dates. Remember each of the things that we do have to work on, that Lab 9 wrap-up quiz, as well as homework 8, and finish up that MWrite, that final revision should be due this week, as well as the beginning of next week we need to complete that next pre-lab. Right. So that about does it. Thank you guys for watching.